rejected, Christ was crucified. Why would the Lord give his life in this way? Now all hope's gone, the scoffers say. for that. Go and take your Bibles, if you would, go to Matthew chapter 28 this morning. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, and we'll begin reading at verse number 1. Matthew chapter number 28, and verse 1, the Bible tells us here, in the end of the Sabbath... As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye. For I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you that we can come together this morning knowing that your son lives. We're thankful, Lord, that there is an empty tomb there in Jerusalem today because of what took place some 2,000 years ago. Lord, I pray this morning our hearts and our minds will be stirred concerning what you did for us. 
Or do you tell us in Hebrews 12 that you endured the shame of the cross for the joy that was set before you, and that joy was to see many coming to you and receiving your wonderful gift of salvation. And Father, I pray again, if there is anybody in this place who does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I pray today would be their day of salvation. I pray it should work now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The setting for us is a familiar setting. We know mo much about this particular event in the Bible. The Bible focuses much on the crucifixion as well as the resurrection. That is because it is the foundation of what we do. It is what gives substance to the message that is preached from this pulpit each and every Sunday as well as Wednesday nights. Uh, and uh, we get together and we gather around the Word of God. If it was not for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there'd be no reason for us to be together this morning. But that first resurrection day was not like this one. This morning we got up and we came to church with great anticipation. Uh, we put on our Sunday best, if you will, and uh, we came in and ready to uh, rejoice and to celebrate that there is a risen Savior. But on that first Sunday, whenever the ladies were coming to the tomb, that was not the case. In fact, there was a very opposite reaction going on. In their hearts, they were filled with mourning. They were filled with sadness. And that was because they had forgotten the words of the Lord. The Bible tells us here in, in Matthew 28, the, uh, uh, the angel, as he, he speaks to the ladies, he tells them uh, here in verse number 6, He is not here, for He is risen. And notice the next three words, as He said. The angel was wanting to remind these ladies that Jesus told you this is what was going to happen. But oftentimes what happens is that sadness blinds us and causes us to miss the truth. And that was what was taking place with this group of believers here this day. You understand these ladies came because they felt a great responsibility. After the crucifixion was over, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went to Pilate and begged for the body of Jesus. And he gave them leave and they took down the body of Jesus and they took it to a new tomb. It was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. He had carved it out and had prepared it uh, for himself and his family. But instead he was going to lay the Savior in that place. Uh, the Bible says that, uh, that Nicodemus and, and Joseph had brought the necessary things to prepare him for burial. So they had spices and they had the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the woven cloth that would be necessary to prepare him and so they wound him and they laid him in that tomb. And, and so there he's laid now uh, for this uh, uh, amount of time. And these ladies are coming and they're going to come into this place and they're going to add some more spices to help preserve the body. Help take care of it, if you will, the way uh, they did in that day. And in fact, on the way there, they had a question. They begin to talk amongst themselves uh, here and they begin to, and I believe it's in the book of Mark uh, in chapter 16, they said, well, who will roll the stone away for us? That was a good question. Yeah. Maybe they thought they could uh, talk the uh, soldiers into rolling it out of the way and they would place the spices on in there and they could put it back in place and do all those things. They came, they wanted to do this, but they had really not sure how we're going to do this. They just wanted to go and show up there that morning. Sabbath had ended. The, the great Passover day had passed. And so now they were allowed to go to this place and to, to do these things. And so here they are uh, early in the morning ready to go and, and take care of these things. But I want you to understand this here. As they're going, their thought is, he's dead. He's dead. You know, many in this world today still believe that. They, they still believe he's dead. There's no question that Jesus died. That nobody has a problem with that because we understand all men have an appointment with death. Uh, whether we are old or young, it doesn't matter your age. Whenever the time is set, uh, the Bible tells that God has numbered our days. And so He knows exactly our death day. And we understand that. And so these, uh, so death is not, is not the problem here. Uh, the Bible, in fact, says in Romans chapter 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Why? Because death is not unusual. A resurrection is unusual. That 
that, that doesn't happen. Okay, if you were to go walking in the cemetery uh, this afternoon and all of a sudden somebody popped up out of the grave, you would go running because that's not normal. And we understand that. And so as we think about this here this morning, we understand that the vast majority of people know that Jesus died and they have no problem with that. But the resurrection is a different story. But you understand the resurrection is very, very important. In fact, without the resurrection, we would, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, we would be, of all men, most miserable. Because there would be no substance to our, our message. I want us to think on a few things here real quick before we move on. But uh, think about this here. If, if, if it was not for the resurrection, then Jesus would not be God. In John chapter number 10, if you would, keep your finger at Matthew 28. We're going to come back to it. I'm going to turn with me to John chapter 10 this morning. In John chapter number 10, the Bible tells us here in verses 17 and 18, <coughs> excuse me, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. You understand that nobody can uh, lay down their life and then raise themselves back up again. That is impossible. But because Jesus did lay down His life, by the way, if Jesus had not said, uh, Lord, I commend uh, unto you my spirit, there in Luke chapter uh, number 22, if He had not said uh, there in John chapter 19, it is finished, and then He gave up the ghost, you understand if He did not willingly give up His spirit, He would still be alive today. He had to willing because why? He was not sinful. He did not commit sin. He was not under the curse of sin that he would have to die. And so he had to willingly lay down his life. And through the power of God, he was willing to, he was able to take it back up again uh, as well. It's, be, it's because of this here, the resurrection proves that Jesus is the Son of God. If he did not rise from the dead, he is not the Son of God. Right. And so it's an extremely important thing. By the way, it also verifies the truth of Scripture. To turn with me to Psalm 16. Psalm chapter number 16. In Psalm chapter number 16 and verse number 10, in the Old Testament as David is writing, he, he talks about this in chapter 16 and verse 10. He says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, uh, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. And that's a promise from God uh, that He was going to raise His Son up uh, from the dead. Uh, that He was not going to let Him stay in that grave because anybody who stays in a grave, they will corrupt. They will waste away. Uh, if there is no life, the flesh falls apart. And He said this here that I, I'm going to raise Him from the dead. He will not suffer corruption. Uh, that's what the Scripture says. So if He did not rise from the dead, do you know what this means about our Bible? You can't trust it. But he did rise from the dead. And he did do exactly as the scripture said. And so therefore we know uh, uh, this is just one of many proofs that we know that the scripture is true. And we can uh, trust what is written in there in Psalm chapter 110 and verse number uh, 1. The Bible says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies uh, thy footstool. Uh, we see in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus uh, rose again. And there he sits on the right hand of the Father. And then until one day he will actually uh, conquer death and sit. He will put it all away and it will be under him and he will rule and reign over all things. Right now death continues to reign. Yes, sir. We know that, don't we? We, we've experienced, we've seen it here as we had to say goodbye to uh, uh, Miss Roberta uh, just a couple months ago. Uh, we saw that death still reigns. I had to say goodbye to my grandma just a couple months ago, and I saw that death still reigns. I had to say goodbye to my good friend Doug uh, just about three months ago, and I was reminded that death still reigns. But listen, there's coming a day. There's coming a day whenever Jesus is going to return to this earth. He's going to take His bride out. He's going to rapture His church. He's going to, the Bible tells in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together 
uh, with Him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We are looking forward to that day we'll be in heaven where there will be no more death, there will be no more pain, there will be no more sickness, there will be no more tears. Why? Because Christ has conquered all. Because He lives today, we know we can trust what the Scriptures say. Jesus had not come out of the tomb. The Scriptures aren't true. Go with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter number 17. This is an important one as well. In Acts chapter 17 <clears throat> and verse 31. Acts chapter 17 verse 31. The Bible tells us here, because He hath appointed a day. There's coming a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. There's coming a day, and the fact that Jesus rose from the dead proves that there is coming a judgment day. Everybody must stand in judgment. If you are saved this morning, hallelujah, you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ because you are saved and you are covered by the blood of Jesus. And we have a guarantee, we have a promise that uh, heaven is our eternal home, but we will be judged by, for our works, excuse me, to uh, determine the rewards He will give to us. But then there's also another judgment. In the book of Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says that death and hell gave up the dead. And all appear before what is called the great white throne. Yeah. And there is one who sits on that throne. And they will have to answer to him that day. And it will not be a question of whether they're going to heaven or hell. It's already sealed. Rather they're going to be judged. And they will see those nail scarred hands. And they will see that pierced side. And they'll see those nail pierced feet. And they will know that that one who sits on the throne did rise from the dead, just as the Scripture says. The Bible tells us here He has appointed Him to be the judge of all the earth. And because He rose from the dead, He is alive to do that very thing. If He was not alive, there would be no judgment. But He is alive. And so there's coming a judgment. By the way, it also does this for us. Because He rose from the dead, it assures our own future resurrection. I have hope. I have hope. As I said goodbye to my friend Doug and, and we, we thought on those things, I, I took the, uh, the congregation to these scriptures in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which I've already referenced, but if you would turn over there and look at these wonderful scriptures here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, we know them, we've heard them. But here's what the Bible tells us. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Because Jesus rose from the dead. I have a guarantee and a promise that I too will rise from the dead. Why? Because I have placed my faith in what Jesus did on the cross to take the place for my sins. And I have a belief that He did rise from the dead that third day just as the Scriptures tell me. I believe what the Scriptures say. And the question is this morning for you, do you believe what the Scriptures say? Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Do you believe that He rose again this morning? Morning. Listen, that is the, that's the plan of salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible says that he, uh, Paul said, I deliver you the gospel, which is this, that uh, first of all, that, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. He died for you. He rose again for you. Do you believe that? It's an amazing story. Yes. It's not one that you will see repeated. 
but it is one that you have to believe. I have a hope that one day when I close my eyes in death, I will rise again. I believe it. You say, boy, that, that seems pretty fanatical. It is. It is. It, it, listen, if anybody else was making the promise, I wouldn't believe them. But because God said, I'm going to do it, I believe them. Amen. I hope this morning you do too. By the way, it's the basis for Christ's priesthood as well. The fact that He rose from the dead in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 28, the Bible tells us that he, has, uh, he, he lives by the power of an endless life, and He is able to save to the uttermost. He lives to intercede for us. He is, a, he is alive today to do those things for us. It gives power for the Christian to live the Christian life. In Romans chapter 6, uh, we have the picture there given to us that, that He, uh, because of His death and burial and resurrection, because of those things, not only does He save us and make a, a home for us in heaven, but He gives us the power to live the Christian life. Not a, We couldn't do it on our own, no. but because of Him, because of what He said. And because He rose from the dead, He gives us the power uh, to walk out and to live uh, those things. Also, it gives us this here. It assures our future inheritance. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, he says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. Not some dead hope. Not some hope that's just a maybe so or, you know, some kind of fanciful thing. No, it is a lively hope. It's a, it's a hope that is alive today that gives assurance in our heart. Uh, he hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because Jesus rose from the dead, I have a hope that is real today. But notice here, he says, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith and His salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Oh, there's coming a day when we'll be gathered together in God's heaven, and we'll get to enjoy that wonderful inheritance He has for us. Uh, that inheritance of being around the throne of God, singing His praises, and enjoying all that He has prepared for us, so that we could come in His presence and be a witness to His glory and His grace for all eternity, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us. We're there. We have an inheritance because He's alive today. If He did not rise from the dead, there is no hope. John chapter 14, Jesus told His disciples, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will doubtless come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. If he's not alive today, if he did not rise from the dead, there is no place. There is no place. There is no hope. The ladies were walking to the tomb that morning. No hope. Why? Because they thought he was dead. And this morning, if all you have is somebody laying in a tomb, you have no hope. You have no hope. Go back to Matthew 28 if you would. Something changed. Something changed. In Matthew chapter number 28 we see, And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. They fainted. I would faint too. Some, some, some guy comes down in a robe, and he looks like lightning and snow. I'm fainting too. There's a great earthquake. Stones are moving. I'm falling over dead. They didn't die, but the Bible says they were as dead. That meant they fainted that day. It was a shocking experience for these fellows. No wonder the Pharisees had to bribe them to change their story. Because I guarantee you, you see something like that, you will remember that for the rest of your life. 
Well, I remember you told, uh, you told the, uh, uh, the, the governor that uh, uh, you guys fell asleep. All right, don't tell anybody this here. We did fall asleep, but it wasn't because we were like sleepy. All of a sudden, this thing showed up. And this, I mean, some guy in a white, in this white uh, uh, garment on and lightning. And so, I mean, it was like craziness. And we just, we, we fainted. It happened. I could see those guys reliving that story uh, many, many years down the road and remembering what, what a wonderful event took place. Whether they ever believed that Jesus rose from the dead or not, one thing is for sure, they knew something happened. They knew. Notice here the Bible says, the angel answered and said unto the women, why? Because the women came upon this scene. <laughs> Those soldiers are supposed to roll the stone back for them. They were hoping to get them to do this here. There they lay passed out. They look up and there it is. That stone is rolled away. But it's not Jesus they see. Instead there is a, a man in, in a white robe. And he's got the, he, he looks this bright countenance upon him. And the first thing out of the man's mouth is this here. The angel's, excuse me, the angel's mouth is this. Fear not. Don't faint too. Fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for He is risen, as He said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell His disciples that He is risen from the dead. And behold, He goeth before you in the galley. There shall ye see Him, I have told, lo, I have told you. They came to the tomb that morning. They thought He was dead. As they arrived at the tomb that day, they spoke with the angel that was there, and they heard he was alive. Yeah. They heard he was alive. <laughs> this morning, I'm thankful that you've come to church. I'm thankful that you felt an impulse. I know many of you are, are regulars, and you show up uh, regularly. Uh, some of you are visiting this morning, and we are so thankful that you have chosen to come and be with us this morning. But regardless of whether you're visiting or whether you are a regular here, we have all heard the story. Yes, We've all heard the story. It is a hard story to believe because it is supernatural. And boy, what a wonderful story. It gives hope, it gives promise there uh, to these here. But again, all it was was something that they heard. We've heard many stories. We saw the pictures and then what not is going on over in Glen Allen this week after the storm that came through and the tornado that touched down over there. And many of us have seen and heard the stories. But nothing compares to those who were there. And if we're not careful, we'll know the story of Easter. We'll have heard of the story of Easter. I heard the story of Easter 14 different times from the time I was a little baby in the nursery up until I was about, oh, I was 15 years old as a sophomore in high school just a few weeks before Easter would be celebrated. I'd heard the story of Easter. If you'd asked me, uh, Brian, can you tell me the story of Easter? I could tell you, yes, Jesus died on the cross. He was crucified uh, and he shed his blood. And Nicodemus and Joseph took him down off the cross and they wrapped him in the, in the, in the cloth and they put the spices in and they laid him in a tomb. And then three days later on a Sunday morning, the stone was rolled away. The angel showed up and he told the ladies, he is not here for he is risen as he said. I could tell you the story because I'd heard it many times. This morning, there may be some who believes he's still dead. He's still dead. If that's the case, you have no hope. You have no hope. It may be this morning that you're like those ladies that, that day, and you're hearing the story, and you're thinking, hmm, isn't that something? It's amazing that some people would believe just about anything. Well, that, that's some story there. It might have happened. It's not enough just to hear this morning. Maybe this morning you're hearing the story of the resurrection for the first time, or maybe for the 40th time. But that's all it is. It's a story. And if the resurrection of Jesus Christ remains as a story to you, 
it is no help to you. You're in the same boat as everybody else who doesn't even believe he's alive today. They think he's still dead. But there's a big change that takes place. These ladies heard the story and they leave from the angel and they begin to run back because they're told to go tell his disciples. But on the way to go tell the disciples, something miraculous happens. Look with me if you would at verse number 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that ye go into Galilee, and there shall ye they see me. Listen, there was an empty tomb that day. Uh, whenever the, 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 uh, the ladies got back after this encounter, they told the disciples, and, and Peter and John got up from their place there in the upper room that they were locked in there because they were scared for their lives. They went running out of that place. Excuse me, they ran and they found where that tomb was. And sure enough, as they ran in, they looked around and they saw those things. The Bible says John stooped down from outside looking in. Peter went rushing in, uh, looking around and just seeing where everything is. He saw the napkin folded over here and the clothes over here. And he looked around and he said, what do you know? Uh, he really is gone. John then walked in after Peter and looked around and said, what do you know? He is gone. Uh, he's not here. And listen, that's all they knew. And we see this here. They go back to the upper room and they are still cast down. Uh, they are still filled with fear. Uh, they are still concerned about things because all they've done is heard the story. But there was a group of them amongst them who knew more than just the story. They had met the risen Savior. They had met the risen Savior. In the book of Luke, the Bible says that Mary Magdalene uh, got to see Him and held onto His feet and worshipped Him there as well. Isn't it interesting that the first ones that Jesus appears to are those who stayed at the cross with Him? Isn't it interesting the one that Jesus showed Himself first to were the ones who were there on a Sunday morning ready to come to take care of the body? Yes, they still had their doubts. Yes, they were uh, having a hard time believing things, but they just knew something in their heart. we got to go take care of the body of our Savior. Uh, we were sure it was Him. And they showed up, and sure enough, they got to see Jesus that day. Listen, friend, you can show up in church and you can do all the church stuff and you can hear all the stories, you can hear all the accounts given to us from the Bible. But listen, until you have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ for yourself, it will mean nothing to you. You cannot hold on to your mom and dad's uh, uh, religion. You cannot hold on to your grandma and grandpa's salvation. You can't hold on to your, uh, your kids' salvation. You can't ca Listen, it doesn't matter who in your life is saved if you don't make the personal choice yourself. It means nothing. That day, those ladies had a personal meeting with Jesus Christ. They started the day off thinking, he's dead. Then they saw an angel. And he told them he that was alive. And they said, well, what do you know? What a story. Go back and tell the disciples. There's, their word on the street is he's alive. But no, they saw him. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible tells us that Jesus was seen of the twelve. He was seen of, of Cephas. He was seen of, of, of different ones along the way. The Bible says at one time he was seen of over 500. At one time he was alive. And then Paul said, then I, I was one who was born out of due time. I was past due. I, I got saved late in the game. But, but praise the Lord, Jesus came and I had a personal meeting with him myself too. It was March 11th, 1990. It was a Sunday night. The evangelist stood up here and preached a message that night. I have no clue what he said because I walked into, that play, into this place under conviction. But by the time we got to the end of the service and he gave the invitation, I can still remember we're sitting back there about where Brother Jeff is sitting back there and hanging on to that front pew there, the pew in front, and just being under conviction. And I can remember finally stepping out and grabbing Brother Tipton who was sitting next to me and telling him I, I, I need to get saved. And we came up to this altar here and he said, now what did you tell me again, son? <laughs> I said, I need to get saved. He said, let's go back here. And so we went to this back room and we sat down and I told him, he said, I need to get saved. I need to receive Christ as my Savior. And he said, well, Brian, surely you're saved. Uh, if anybody's saved, I said, no, sir, I'm not. I know. 
And he said, well, you know the plan of salvation. You know Jesus died for you and He rose again to save you. from. I know all that. I don't know why I asked Him to come with me in the first place. <laughs> I thought we had to have a partner to make sure, everything, you know, get a witness. But I can remember kneeling down at these, these little blue stairs back here. And in that place, I met Jesus. Amen. Oh, He didn't come down physically and, and stand there as, a, as a, some televangelist might tell you, some 600 foot Jesus standing over the top of Him or something like that. But just as real as I'm talking to you this morning, He came down to me that day. Amen. And He took the burden of sin away from me. And He gave me salvation and He saved my soul uh, that night. And I came out of that place that evening uh, a brand new person. Why? Because I had been born again. Yeah. I had my own personal call. I had my own personal meeting with Jesus. And now I have my own personal relationship with Him. Yeah. This morning... The resurrection's a good story if all it is is a story to you. But if you've met Jesus and you have a personal relationship with Him this morning, it's more than just a story. It has changed your life. This morning, if you're saved in here, there should be something going on inside this morning saying, thank God He's alive. Amen. Thank God He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. And I'm thankful that He does. But listen, friend, if you don't have that assurance in your heart today, here's what He says. Come unto me. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He says, I want to take that burden of sin from you, and I'll give you my burden. My burden is easy. My burden is light. And I'll tell you this here. I can remember that day. And boy, the weight of sin that was on me was heavy. I didn't realize how heavy it was. But his burden is light. This morning is the resurrection just a story to you. Have you met Jesus for yourself? If you have not, I invite you to come today. Let somebody take a Bible and show you what it means to receive Christ as your personal Savior. Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your heart, but rather open your heart and receive the message of salvation and say, God, I don't want to just know the story, or I want to know the Christ of the story. Father, help us today.